Today we're going to talk about the Adobe Captivate features that new users struggle with the most. Okay, so we're going to talk about some of the things that, that new Adobe Captivate users struggle with uh, understanding and uh, hopefully we'll shed some light into some of these areas that might be a little confusing for you right now. First thing I want to talk about is uh, pause points on the timeline here. And if you take a look at this project that I have here, it's pretty straightforward. If I extend the, the length of this particular project and we'll extend the items that are on the screen, we're going to talk about the fact that there are, in this instance, uh, five different interactive objects. Interactive objects can be a lot of things. More often than not, there's some form of button. So for example, I have four buttons on this slide, or five buttons as the case may be, and you might want to have those buttons appear, uh, you know, roughly one second apart, one after the other, and that's fine. But one of the things to always remember about buttons is that there's going to be a pause point assigned to those buttons. So as you can see here, and if I extend these items to the end of the slide, here's a hint, by the way, using the shortcut key, Control or Command E will extend an object to the end of the slide, as I've done here. What's going to happen is that this slide's going to play through, and it's going to pause at the one and a half second mark and wait for the users to do something. Now, that means that uh, button number two and button number three and so on won't appear until the user presses button number one, releasing that pause point and continue playing the slide. And that actually leads me to another aspect, and that has to do with actions versus advanced actions. So by its very nature, Adobe Captivate uh, when you add an interactive object to um, Captivate, it actually has a series of actions that are available to it. And you can select those from your properties inspector. As you can see here, I'm actually changing the state of one of the objects on this particular slide. I'm returning it to its normal state. But one of the interesting things about actions, that uh, single actions, we think of them as single actions, that we're just doing one thing, otherwise we'd be using advanced actions. There's actually an automatic continue playing the project turned on by default. In recent versions of Adobe Captivate, starting with, I think it might have been version 8 or 9, we started to see the ability that you could override this by unchecking continue playing the project. But in the past, uh, you know, if you, if you uh, ran a particular action, uh, such as showing an object or hiding an object, it automatically would start playing the project from that particular point. And this is actually a reason why you might want to use advanced actions instead. Because with uh, advanced actions, if I just pop into this particular advanced action, you can see I'm running a bunch of actions. And the only thing that's going to happen here is these actions that you see listed here. In fact, I've got some other actions on this tab as well. So, you know, in a lot of cases, I would recommend using advanced actions because you have a lot more control over how the project gets played. Let me close this for a moment and go back to this original button here that's a, a smart shape used as a button. I'm changing the state of this object to normal, but again, by its very nature, this action will continue playing the project from that point. So when a user clicks on this button, it's going to release the slide from being paused and start to play again. And therefore, you'll see the next button and it will pause at that point as well. Now, this might be fine for this particular interaction. You may want the slide to eventually continue once you've played or, or pressed all of these buttons. But the downside is, is that it's not going to pause and wait for the user to click next and move on to the next slide. In fact, once the user has pressed all these buttons one time, this slide will automatically go to the next slide 
just by its very nature. So uh, again, another benefit of using advanced actions versus single actions, which like I said, aren't really single actions at all. The other thing I want to talk about, especially with interactive objects, is the fact that you'll sometimes see objects when you drag them to the end of the slide, you'll see this little tiny red triangle. And a lot of people don't understand what that means. It's really quite simple and it's actually quite useful. If you wanted to force navigation, in other words, you wanted to hide a next button or some other type of button until a certain point on the timeline, you can actually anchor it to the end of the slide. And that's what I've done here. So if I decide to record some audio that extends the length of the slide, that button that appears for the last three or four seconds will always be the last three or four seconds because it's now it's been anchored to the end of the slide. If you wish to break that anchoring, just drag it away from the end of the slide and then it will continue to uh, you know, move as it would normally. But again, if you want it uh, connected to the end of the slide, just jam it up to the end there. You see the red triangle and whatever length or duration of the slide will now be incorporated into that. One last thing I wanted to mention, and this is uh, where I think people struggle a lot with understanding the timeline, and that's uh, with audio that's been attached to the slide. So let me import some audio to this particular slide, and I'll just show you an example of what I mean. So I'm going to save this to the slide here. It is going to extend the uh, duration of this slide a little bit, but that's okay. So one of the things that is a challenge with audio is that people assume that these pause points associated with all these buttons that appear on this particular slide will also not only pa pause the action that's occurring on screen, but will also pause the audio as well. And in fact, that's one thing that's different on the timeline from all the other things that are on the timeline, and that's slide audio. So when I add slide audio and I play it from the beginning portion of this slide, you would think that when it reaches this original pause point that the audio would pause as well. That's not the case. Audio will continue to play until all the audio has been played for that particular slide. Um, one of the things that it's important to note is that if your slide audio occurs after that first pause point, uh, we won't hear the slide audio. So that's one of the differences that occurs. So if you wanted to not play the slide audio by default, you could actually place a button on your slide that maybe says play slide. And that would, of course, uh, then unpause the slide and continue playing. And of course, then users would hear the audio. But when audio is before any pause point, you will hear the entire audio and it won't be affected by the pauses that you see on the timeline. So hopefully that helps you out, guys. There's Again, the timeline is a tricky thing to remember. Uh, there definitely are some differences there. And uh, it can be a little confusing at times, but uh, continue to subscribe to my videos and I'll try to share little various hints and tips that will help you along the way. If you thought this video was useful, please like and share with your colleagues. If you need help with your next e-learning project, hire me. My focus is to create effective e-learning that achieves your business goals. Visit my website at CaptivateTeacher.com and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel.